Hello and welcome to this review of the Autumn Budget 2021. In this session, we are going to focus on business tax measures. My name is Ros Martin. Actually, not a lot of headline issues to discuss, really, in this session. Lots and bits of pieces announced, but nothing that is going to have a really material impact on most advisors dealing with owner-managed businesses, perhaps one or two things that are more important than others. But let's go through the things that have been announced. The first measure is one that has been announced previously, but where the details are now confirmed, and that is the residential property developer tax. This measure was announced as part of a package of measures that will enable the government to address unsafe cladding in high-rise buildings. The intention is to raise £2 billion over 10 years from this tax, which will enable the government to finance changes to cladding in these buildings. It will apply with effect from the 1st of April 2022 to relevant profits arising after that date from residential property development activities. The rate of tax is 4%, but it will only apply to profits exceeding the annual allowance of £25 million. So it really is targeted at large property developers and not small building companies or people who undertake the odd property development here or there. So hopefully it's not going to have a big impact on most people within the market. The next measure had already been announced as well, but this is one that will have a much bigger impact potentially, and that is basis period reform. So it was announced in July that... The government were looking to change the basis periods for unincorporated businesses and partnerships such that the tax basis period aligns with the tax year. So basically you will be taxed on the profits arising in the tax year regardless of what your accounting date is. Now this would apply from the 24-25 tax year and one of the major criticisms of this proposal is that that is the date from which making tax digital for income tax purposes will be effective. And I think the commentators felt that this was a lot to change at the same time. Both of those measures have actually been delayed by a year but they're still happening at the same time. So from 24-25, you simply take the profits arising in the tax year, regardless of what your accounting period is. The government aren't mandating every business to have a particular accounting date. But obviously, if you have an accounting date that is not aligned with the tax year, it is going to become more complicated to calculate your profits. It should be noted for these purposes that the 31st of March will be treated as aligning with the tax year so that you don't have to do an apportionment of a couple of days. The transitional year for these proposals will be 23-24, when for any business that does not have a tax year aligned accounting period, there will be a long accounting period taxed. So, for example, if you have a 31st of December year end, you will be taxed on the profits from the 1st of January 2023 through to the 5th of April 2024. So you'll have around a 15 month accounting period. So it's basically your normal basis period plus the period from the end of that basis period to the end of the tax year. Any overlap relief that's being carried forward will be used in that year. Now, the narrative on this proposal states that the original proposals published in July 2021 have been revised to incorporate changes such as more flexible use of overlap relief in the transitional year and also provisions to reduce the impact of transitional profits on allowances and benefits. We will not know details of these changes until the finance bill is actually published. If you do have excess profits in that transitional year, the initial proposal was to spread that for up to five years. But again, we don't know how that will have been changed. So around 7% of unincorporated sole traders and around one third of unincorporated partnerships, though, of course, all partnerships are treated as unincorporated for the basis period rules, do not currently have a 31st of March year end. And those businesses will need to consider how these proposals are going to affect them. One or two changes to 
capital allowances or for capital allowances purposes. Annual investment allowance is set at £200,000, but has been at an increased rate of £1 million, both of those figures being per year. For a couple of years, that £1 million extended annual investment allowance was due to end on the 31st of December 2021, but is now being extended to the 31st of March 2023 for both income tax and corporation tax purposes. As with all changes to AIA, there will be the normal transitional rules to determine how much AIA is available for any accounting periods that straddle the date of change being the 1st of April 2023. There is to be an amendment to the provisions as to how you calculate capital allowances on vehicles. Now, the rate of capital allowances on cars depends on the CO2 emissions and Basically, the legislation is being amended to confirm that the CO2 emissions figure to be used is that arising from the worldwide harmonised light vehicle test procedures. And in fact, the vehicle excise duty and company car tax provisions are also being amended to reflect this as well. And this will take place for vehicle excise duty for licences taken out on or after the 3rd of November 2021 and for capital announces and company car tax. The legislation will take effect following royal assent of the finance bill. There are also changes to the details that need to be provided uh, when structures and buildings allowance claims are being made. One or two miscellaneous corporation tax provisions announced, though for none of these do we have very many details at this stage. The Chancellor announced yesterday in the budget that R&D tax reliefs will be reformed from April 2023. A lot was said, but the main comment made by the Chancellor during the budget speech was that the availability of R&D relief must be linked more to expenditure being incurred in the UK. So again, we will see details of these in the future, but it may well be that there will be a restriction going forward on expenditure, which can be qualifying for R&D tax reliefs. There is a technical amendment to the corporate loss relief rules, which will apply retrospectively for accounting periods beginning on or after the 1st of January 2019 to ensure that companies that adopt IFRS 16 can continue to benefit from an exemption that restricts loss carry forwards in companies that are in financial distress. So normally you can't carry forward losses where the company is in financial distress, but there is an exemption where there are transactions involving lease renegotiations to avoid insolvency. And those provisions are now extended to those companies adopting IFRS 16 as well. There is an amendment to the provisions relating to group relief. For accounting periods ending on or after the 27th of October 2021, there is to be a repeal of the provisions which allow losses to be surrendered into the UK from EEA resident companies. This is an amendment brought on by the UK's exit from the European Union. However, group relief rules relating to EEA resident companies will now be extended to all non-UK resident companies such that those companies will be able to surrender losses of a UK permanent establishment into other UK companies. These provisions are very restrictive because it is only going to be possible to surrender those losses into the UK if they cannot be deducted from any non-UK profits of any person for any period. So it's never been a provision which many people have been able to take advantage of. There are a couple of technical amendments to diverted profits tax, such that DPT is now going to be considered as a tax covered by the UK Double Tax Treaty Network, which means that double tax relief will be available for companies caught under the DPT provisions. There's also going to be an interaction between the DPT review period and company tax return inquiries, which basically means that it is not going to be possible to amend a company tax return where the DPT review period is still open. And then finally, again, these are proposals which were announced previously. There are going to be some changes announced to the REIT provisions, that's real estate investment trusts. And those are the conditions that must apply for a company to qualify as a UK REIT. 
The objective of the changes is to reduce the administrative burden to enhance the attractiveness of the regime for those investing in real estate in the UK. Details in your notes of the changes to be introduced. The Chancellor announced a raft of measures to provide additional support for the creative industries through three particular cultural tax reliefs. Theatre tax relief and museum and galleries exhibition tax relief, the rates are going up. So the rates will go up to 45% for non-touring productions and 50% for touring productions from the 27th of October 2021. The rates will go down from the 1st of April 2023 to 30 or 35% respectively and from the 1st of April 2024 down to the current level of 20% or 25% depending on whether it is a touring or a non-touring production. In addition, the rate of orchestra tax relief increases to 50% for expenditure from the 27th of October, again reducing to 35% from the 1st of April 2023 and returning to the normal level of 25% from the 1st of April 2024. Additionally, Museum and Galleries Exhibition Tax Relief is to be extended to the 31st of March 2024 rather than being abolished from 2022 as was intended. And there is a technical change to film tax relief so that from the 1st of April 2022, film productions which initially qualify for film tax relief but then where their intention changes during production such that they meet the criteria for a high-end television tax relief will be able to continue claiming film tax relief going forward. So obviously sometimes films start off being made for cinema release but then they change to be made for television but they will continue to be able to claim film tax relief. A couple of other changes to announce. Bank surcharge is reducing from 8% to 3%, with the surcharge allowance going up from £25 million to £100 million, both of those applying from the 1st of April 2023. This follows on from quite a detailed review that was announced in the budget at the beginning of 2021. Quite controversial but I think it's felt by the government that the banks have now paid sufficiently for the support that they received in the credit crunch. From the 1st of April 2022, there is going to be a new tax regime for asset holding companies, AHCs, which is designed to ensure competitiveness within the UK for asset management and investment funds. Basically, investors will be taxed as if they have invested in the underlying assets, and any intermediate holding companies in these structures will pay no more tax than is proportionate to the activities that they perform. So basically the regime exempts from tax within the asset holding company gains on share disposals and overseas property disposals and profits of overseas property businesses where the AHC qualifies, assuming that those profits are subject to tax in an overseas jurisdiction. There is then a whole raft of provisions where various corporation tax provisions are amended in order to facilitate the introduction of these provisions. Again, details are within the notes if you wish to have a look at them. Again, not too many provisions to talk about from a VAT perspective. We have introduction of measures relating to VAT registered businesses who are authorised to operate in a free zone custom site of a free port the main benefit for these businesses is that they will be able to zero rate supplies and also services carried out on goods in those zones will be capable of being zero rated subject to meeting of conditions. Obviously there are anti-avoidance provisions to make sure that when goods leave a free zone that there is no onward supply of those goods and there's quite a lot of anti-avoidance provisions to deal with any breach of these rules. There is a new VAT exemption applying retrospectively from the 1st of January 2021 on the importation of dental prosthetics into the UK. There is an amendment to an anomaly which arises from the Northern Ireland Protocol such that motor vehicle dealers in Northern Ireland may not use the VAT margin scheme for second-hand vehicles when they are purchasing vehicles from Great Britain and therefore have to account for VAT on the full selling price. 
There are two measures announced to remedy this. One is described as an interim measure and the other is to enable the introduction of a second-hand motor vehicle export refund scheme. We await further details of these. And finally, there is a consultation announced on options to simplify the VAT treatment of fund management fees. And finally, we have the plethora of announcements that we always get about the rates of different duties that will apply. So things like landfill tax, gaming duty, vehicle excise duties for cars, vans, motorcycles, heavy goods vehicles and so on. And of course, let's not forget tobacco duty. There was a big announcement about the fact that alcohol duty rates would be overhauled. Um, the rates are actually being frozen and the regime is being simplified so that there are fewer bans with the intention that at lower alcohol uh, will have a lower tariff and higher alcohol will have a higher tariff, although there was uh, a reduction in the duty that will apply to sparkling wines and Prosecco. Technical amendments also apply to things like plastic packaging tax, insurance premium tax and so on. That brings us to the end of this session. Thank you for your time today and goodbye.